Hello, everyone. My name is Charlotte Mo, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this global webinar on integrating labor migration reporting in the journalism curriculum. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the Philippines experience. During the next 90 minutes, we will discuss with our guest speakers how we can equip future journalists with the skills and knowledge needed to cover labor migration issues. Just before we get started, some quick housekeeping remarks. Uh, please be informed that uh, this webinar is being recorded and that the recording will be made available online afterwards. Uh, the link will be sent shortly after the end of the webinar and feel free to share it with whoever might be interested. Um, time permitting, we will give the opportunity to the audience to ask questions to our speakers. If you wish to ask a question, please write your name, your title, your organization and question in the Q&A section. And during the webinar, we will be using the chat box to share some links and references to reports, websites, and other relevant resources from our speakers. Now, to start, I would like to give the floor to Ramon Toison, uh, Secretary General of AMIC and Chairman of the CHED Technical Committee for Communication for some opening remarks. Ramon. Thank you, Salamat Charles. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, to some, it may be good morning or even good evening. Warm welcome to all. May I start by acknowledging the presence of the newly appointed AIJC president, Dr. Professor Olivia Villaverte, the Commission on Higher Education Technical Committee for Jour Journalists and Chairman, Professor Ben Domingo, ILO National Coordinator for the Integrated Program on Fair Recruitment, Mr. Hossein Makarambon, and the Chairperson of the World Journalism Education Council, Ms. Verica Rupar. My dear friends, there's a migrant worker in almost every household, particularly in developing Asian countries. And there's a story to be told in many of these households. The question is, are we telling these stories? Or better still, are we telling these stories correctly? AIJC with support from the Fair Recruitment Initiative of ILO has given us a tool to help current and future journalists adequately tell the stories of labor migrants, sad stories, and of course, happy stories which perhaps abound, but we do not often hear. After about two years, AIJC completed crafting the reporting on labor migration syllabus. The syllabus will be shared today as mentioned by Charles including the lessons and experiences that went into its crafting. I congratulate the project team led by AIJC Director, Senior Director Anne Lourdes Lopez, and the many journalism teachers across the country who participated in the different project activities, workshops, one-on-one -on -one coaching, online consultations. I acknowledge the guidance given by Charles during the entire process. Maraming salamat, Charles. Today's event is brought to you by the Asian Media Information and Communication Center, or AMIC, and the World Journalism Education Council, WJEC, in cooperation with UNESCO. Recently, UNESCO also launched the reporting on migrants and refugees Handbook for Journalism Educators. This is available online and can be downloaded. Today's forum is part of several activities commemorating AMIC's 50th anniversary. May I also invite you to join our 20th, 28th AMIC conference. This is scheduled on 20 and 27 November and on December 4. Our theme is science communication managing the now and the future. Among our confirmed plenary speakers is MIT Professor Emeritus Noam Chomsky, who is not only one of the world's leading intellectuals, 
but a very strong advocate and supporter of labor unionism. I look forward to a very fruitful forum. Maraming salamat po. Over to you, Charles. Thank you very much, uh, Ramon. Um, and uh, as you've said very well in your opening remarks, uh, labor migration is a very important global phenomenon. Now you're well placed and the other speakers as well speaking from the Philippines to know that. Um, and we know how important labor migration is in the Philippines. Um, what we also know and what you've rightly said is that journalists are often ill-equipped to cover such topics. Um, uh, covering labor migration requires a certain number of skills. Obviously, it requires to, to understand what labor migration is about. It requires some knowledge about the economics, the political, the social, the cultural aspect of labor migration. It would ideally require some good understanding of the legal framework um, of labor migration, which can be um, international. Um, but which can also be uh, regional or national and is often quite complex. And then it also requires some very specific journalism skills. Um, they're not necessarily specific to labor migration. You could uh, say that they're um, uh, relevant in any type of uh, human interest reporting, um, but they are skills that uh, in the classroom, in journalism education institutions, we don't always have the necessary time uh, to look at, and we don't necessarily have the time to connect to such global issues as labor migration. And that's specifically uh, what this course is trying to do. Uh, we will see, and Hussein will, uh, Hussein Makarambon from the ILO will, will tell us a little bit how the ILO is committed to engaging with the media to improve labor migration reporting and how this body of work has been done over time and this activity, the crafting of a labor migration reporting elective course, falls very well um, uh, within that. Um, so today we're going to have the opportunity to listen to different speakers who have all played an important role in this story. Um, they'll be speaking from different uh, point of views, um, uh, from the International Labor Organization, from um, uh, the AIJC, which has piloted this whole initiative, but also from uh, CHED, uh, the institution in the Philippines uh, that is responsible uh, for approving uh, journalism education curriculum. And lastly, our uh, last speaker, most importantly, will be one of those journalism educators who will actually be teaching this course. Um, so we're very pleased uh, to be with you. Um, just before the launch of this webinar, we received an update and we have uh, um, audience registering from almost all continents um, and we're very excited um, to share this experience with you and to hope that this experience will maybe um, give ideas to some educators outside of the Philippines uh, to pick up uh, on the syllabus and maybe launch labor migration reporting elective courses in other countries. Um, Hossein Makarambon, I'd like to start with you. Um, you joined the ILO Manila office as the national project coordinator for a project which is called FAIR, the Integrated Program on Fair Recruitment. Now, this is a global project which seeks to contribute to the promotion of what we call fair recruitment practices. Um, it's a global project, but it also looks at some specific migration corridors in North Africa, in the Middle East, and in South Asia. This project has some target countries, which include Tunisia, Jordan, Nepal, and the Philippines. Um, could I ask you maybe to give our audience a quick overview of labor migration dynamics in the Philippines, and maybe relate that also to how the ILO is connecting labor migration issues to the role of the media. Thank you, Charles. Um, and and uh, again, I'm very excited to be part of this webinar. No? Um, ILO has been working on this um, subject in terms of engaging um, journalists since uh, the start of the Integrated Program on Fair Recruitment or the Fair Project. 
As you mentioned, uh, Charles, there are several drivers of labor migration, no? migration in general. You've mentioned about political, um, social, cultural, um, and, and of course, economic drivers. No? And, and to contextualize it in the case of the Philippines, I think one of the main drivers of labor migration is economic factors. No? And this is what I'm going to focus on because of the limited time, but again, the syllabus that we've developed for journalism students here in the Philippines actually cover a lot of these drivers. So for economic drivers, the main question to, to raise is why are Filipinos leaving the Philippines? And I would like to point out three uh, very interrelated factors. One, of course, is poverty. We know that the population living below 1.25 US dollars per day is about one out of five Filipinos. And the working poor, uh, which by definition are those who earn less than $2 a day, that's about um, four Filipinos out of, out of 10. No? So, so it's, it's quite significant. The second factor I would like to emphasize is underemployment. So under, underemployment is those who are actually employed but are still looking for additional hours of work to basically augment the household income. So they need more money to support their family. No? Um, so unemployment in the Philippines was 5.4% in 2016. It actually increased um, to 8.7% in 2020. And of course, we could probably assume that this is because of the pandemic. Um, underemployment, however, uh, decreased from 17.3% in 2016 to 14.4% uh, in 2020. And this is, of course, a factor of unemployment rising. Um, we have about 5.75 million people looking for more hours of, of work, no? Add to that the actual number of un unemployed Filipinos that is actually driving uh, people no, to look for opportunities outside the country. The last um, economic driver that I want to emphasize is in-work poverty, you know, and this is quite related to under, underemployment. So we've taken the average, you know, a 10-year average of the GDP, and it actually increased by 5.3%. You know? So this is quite constant. And I think this, this is quite clear to many of us that over the, the period between 20, 2004 and 2014, uh, the economy was, was doing significantly well. No? Um, employment also increased no, by 1.9% over this period, and labor productivity increased um, by 3.4%, again, over that decade. But despite all these economic gains, there are actually no, in real, no increases in, in real wages. So people are still getting pretty much what they were earning in, to, in 2004. And that will tell you a lot no, in terms of inflation, in terms of of their per capita income, their purchasing power, it's, it's significant, it hasn't significantly increased alongside the economy um, um, pretty much performing well. No? So that, that really tells you that um, economic factors are actually affecting the decision of people to look for, for jobs outside. Um, if, I, if, if, um, if we can see the next slide, please. So in terms of, of, in terms of the profile no, of labor migration from the Philippines, uh, we also have an average of uh, more than 1.4 million overseas Filipino workers deployed every year since 2010. Uh, 1.84 million overseas Filipino workers were deployed in 2013. And this actually peaked no, um, in 2019 at 1.95 million overseas Filipino workers being deployed. If you take an average, that's about 5,000 to 6,000 Filipinos leaving every day. So you see 6,000 people at the airport trying to look for jobs abroad, no? outside the Philippines. Of course, in, in 2020, this kind of dropped, but again, this was uh, mainly due to the pandemic. Also, the personal remittance has, has been quite constant no? at about 10% of the GDP. Um, and and, and um, I think one point that we need to emphasize here is that remittances remain to be the same despite the pandemic. So I compared the data between 2019 and 2020, 
And it seems that even if people are losing jobs, they wanted to support their families here in the Philippines. The top receiving countries for overseas Filipino workers are the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Qatar. And the dominant um, sector would be service sector, including the most vulnerable, which is the domestic, uh, domestic workers. Next slide, please. I just want to emphasize here, no? in terms of labor migration, we're really looking, we're really looking at the temporary uh, workers, no? those who are bound by their contracts. No? So you have permanent OF overseas Filipinos. These are basically naturalized. Uh, residents of, of, of the destination country, and you have irregular um, um, overseas Filipinos. No? But in terms of labor migration, we have to really look at the temporary migration, meaning they're going to leave the country and they're going to come back once their contracts end. No? So this is very important for us to actually look at labor migration from this very uh, specific perspective. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of, of the engagement of, uh, in terms of uh, media engagement, the ILOs have actually done a number of, of things now. Well, we have developed a toolkit on forced labor and fair recruitment that targets journalists. We've also uh, launched a global media competition, competition on labor migration since 2015. So now we're on our sixth year, if not going to our seventh now. Um, of course, we're really banking on media you know, as a fourth estate, particularly because the ILO is working as a tripartite um, um, body. You know? So we have a tripartite way of uh, consulting our constituents. So we have government, we have um, employers' organizations, and we have workers' organizations. But in some countries of destinations, migrant workers are, not, are actually not recognized, you know? and, and they're not allowed to join unions or form unions. So we have to look at another um, um, uh, constituent, another social partner to complete that triangle. And we think that the media as a fourth estate would actually hold uh, our other constituents to account, particularly if there are violations to the rights of migrant workers. And that's one way to actually protect uh, migrant uh, workers' rights. So, in terms of, of engaging the media, we have a number of, of, of initiatives, no? but I, we think that we still need to actually go down to, to the, the foundation of journalists. And this is really where the development of this labor migration curriculum that targets journalism undergraduate students in collaboration with the Asian Institute for Journalism and Communication is actually um, making a lot of, 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 of ground. Now, it's really gaining traction in terms of the appreciation from the different schools of journalism. We have piloted this in a number of schools. And I think one of our journalism educators is here to, to basically explain this. AIJC is also going to explain the, um, the whole um, initiative from, from start uh, up to the finalization of uh, labor migration curriculum. So I hope I answered your question, Charles. Thank you very much, uh, Hussein. And it's true that uh, it's sometimes surprising to see how, how important this issue is. And we could all um, try and look at the media reporting that we receive. Are we receiving a fair share of information about not only the, the, these, the general topic of labor migration, but some of the specific challenges that you were suggesting, and it's especially tying the, the dots between issues such as um, unemployment or underemployment, um, uh, labor migration. Um, and also we can imagine how difficult this story might be to tell at times because it involves a very international global dimension. And for a journalist who is based in the Philippines, reporting on an issue that happens in, in Denmark or in France or in Kuwait uh, might be quite challenging to do. Uh, and that's part of what we've tried to, to answer, or at least some of the questions we've tried to raise in developing the syllabus. Moving on, I'd like to invite um, Anne Lourdes Lopez in, in the conversation. Anne, um, you are the Senior Director, Research, Policy and Advocacy um, uh, Unit of the Manila-based Asian Institute of Journalism and Communication, which we often call AIJC. Um, You've been a project manager of this ILO-AIJC partnership on fair recruitment 
and therefore you've played a key role in the development of the course syllabus on reporting on labor migration and also on, on the rollout. We've spent countless hours on, on Zoom. Uh, it was the morning here, the evening in the Philippines, and you were really dedicated um, uh, to this project. You're also currently overseeing as project director and senior advisor, um, the EU funded safeguarding journalists and human rights defenders in the Philippines, which is a project that's implemented by AIJC with international media support. And since you still have some free time, uh, you're also the head of the National Secretariat <laughs> for the <laughs> annual Civic Journalism Community Press Awards, very important journalism awards um, in uh, the Philippines of the Philippine Press Institute, which is the National Association of Newspapers in the Philippines. Um, now, Anne, you were really uh, at the heart of this whole process. Could you tell us a little bit how the course syllabus uh, was designed? Thank you, Charles. Uh, no, I don't have free time <laughs> with all those projects going on. Uh, but uh, let me share our story. In crafting the syllabus on reporting on labor migration, we first made sure that we knew what the guidelines are from the Commission on Higher Education or CHED. This is the government agency that prepares the plans, policies, and strategies for higher education institutions or HEIs. Specifically, we referred to the CHED Memorandum Order 41 series of 2017 on policies, standards, and guidelines for Bachelor of Journalism and Bachelor of Arts in Journalism programs. The memo identifies specialized beat reporting on overseas migration as an elective course. As part of the process, we did a quick survey among some journalism faculty members in universities and colleges in the country to find out if any such course on labor migration reporting was being taught or has had been taught. The survey yielded the information that the University of Santo Tomas or UST more than a decade ago had offered a specialized reporting course on migration reporting. Unfortunately, a copy of the syllabus has been lost. Then using the CHED outcomes and competency-based framework, we defined the lear desired learning outcomes and identified competencies or performance indicators. As you know, these are the knowledge, attitudes, or values and skills expected of students. After determining the desired outcomes and competencies, we now proceeded to prepare the course content outline collaboratively with ILO, accessing online resources. We adapted substantively the ILO resource reporting on forced labor migration and fair recruitment, an ILO toolkit for journalists. A material or a resource that Charles here, uh, Monsieur Charles Ottoman, helped develop. Uh, this is an interactive training material that has been used and adapted for training journalists globally. With the course outline finalist, finalized, I mean, we then prepared the full-blown course syllabus, ensuring that we complied with the minimum requirements of CHED 
for a course syllabus as found in the CHED Memorandum Order. To engage journalism teachers in the development of the syllabus, we reached out to journalism schools in identifying the HEIs we were going to work with, we started with a 2019 CHED list of 59 journalism schools nationwide. Of these 59 schools, we were able to get the contact information of 40 HEIs. We wrote to these 40 schools, inviting them to a webinar on labor migration reporting. But before meeting online with these journalism educators in the webinar, we emailed them, we sent to them the draft course syllabus for feedback and took note of their comments that they sent back to us. During the two-day webinar on labor migration reporting, we presented and discussed the course syllabus with 34 faculty members from 19 HEIs in Metro Manila, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So out of the 40 HEIs, we had written to 19 responded. Their main concerns were how they could be capacitated to teach the course, that's one. And the second is how they could include the course in their journalism curriculum. We also had two journalism faculty members from the National Management Degree College in Yangon, Myanmar, as invited by Mr. Ramon Tuazon, the chairperson of the CHED Technical Committee for Journalism, Professor Ben Domingo, during the webinar, played an instrumental role in explaining to the teachers that they could offer the course as an elective without needing the approval of CHED. He also clarified that the course syllabus is a flexible guide that could be adapted to each school's context. Over to you, Charles. Thank you, Anne. And just quickly, um, you know, as you were saying, journalism educators were very strongly associated with the whole process. Um, uh, could you tell us a little bit how that worked? Uh, I've understood that uh, they were associated at the beginning but also once the syllabus was, was crafted in making sure that they were correctly equipped to be able to teach the course, um, they were uh, really in, in the whole process. Yes, aside from soliciting feedback from the teachers invited to the webinar uh, and involving them in the webinar, in the discussion, on the syllabus, we invited the 34 teachers to sign up for pilot teaching the course. Of the 34 teachers, 11, well, we were, we were really conservatively expecting one or two of the teachers to sign up for pilot teaching. But of the 34 teachers, 11 of them signed up for the two-day coaching with, with you, Charles, on how to teach the course. The understanding with these 11 teachers was that they would be pilot teaching, reporting on labor migration this first semester of 2021-2022. During the coaching with Charles, the group coaching with Charles, which was a two day, a half day activity. It was further discussed how the syllabus could be adapted or tweaked by the teachers 
to suit their school situation and the needs of the students. The group coaching was followed by one-on-one -on -one sessions by Charles again, with nine journalism educators from eight HEIs over a period of two months. This one-on-one -on -one session uh, ranged. This one-on-one -on -one sessions ranged from thirty minutes to one hour for four times for a maximum of four times with Charles per school. These were individualized sessions to address specific concerns of the teachers on how to adapt the syllabus and how to better teach the course. To date, seven HEIs have started or will start to teach to pilot teach reporting on labor migration this first semester of 2021 to 2022. Let me uh, cite these schools. One is the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Two is the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Three is Lyceum of the Philippines University. Four is Kalayaan College. Five is Colegio de San Lorenzo. Six is Cavite State University. And seven is University of San Jose de Coletos in Cebu. So we have three state universities and four private colleges and universities. Also, it is noteworthy that the University of Santo Tomas or UST, which pioneered in teaching migration journalism as a specialized reporting course, has reintroduced it this first semester. The elective course is being taught as reporting on global migration and is using the project's course syllabus as an input for the UST course plan. I must also commend the seven teachers who are trailblazing in pilot teaching the course on reporting on labor migration. I personally treasure the fact that they had committed to pilot teach even before we announced that the project was providing them a modest honorarium. Thank you to the seven teachers for your inspirational gesture. I, I must also add that PUP, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, which starts classes in October, will be teaching not one, but three classes of the reporting on labor migration. Thank you very much, Anne. And it's really, uh very interesting to note how uh, the syllabus that we crafted and, and this whole initiative that we started without knowing if um, educators and faculties would uh, pick up on this initiative uh, has uh, definitely um, had a lot of um, interest. Um, and we're really now entering into the most exciting phase of teachers being in front of students and maybe getting some feedback uh, from their experiences to see also how uh, students um, find this course um, interesting. Um, you've uh, said in your presentation that uh, this whole work was done uh, with um, respect to um, national uh, memorandums and uh, curriculum standards which are set out in the Philippines by a commission which is called CHED. Now we have the pleasure um, to have Professor Ben Domingo with us. Professor Domingo, you are precisely the chairman of the Commission on Higher Education uh, Technical Committee for Journalism. Now that committee is in charge of crafting the standard undergraduate and graduate journalism curricula in the Philippines. You're also a member of the CHED Technical Panel for Social Science and Communication. 
Uh, and since, uh, like Anne, you have a lot of free time, uh, you're also special <laughs> professorial lecturer in journalism at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, which uh, Anne just mentioned. And you have professional involvements with the Philippine Association of Communication Educators and the Journalism Studies Association of the Philippines. You are a trainer in such areas as campus press, community media, citizen journalism, a multimedia pr practitioner, and your vast experience includes being a publisher, an editor, a news editor, a news and feature writer, and a radio anchor person and commentator. Um, I'd like to ask you if you could explain to us a little bit how the CHED journalism curriculum is structured and why this new elective course on labor migration reporting actually fits into the broader Philippines journalism curriculum. Um, and I'd also like you maybe to share your thoughts on what you consider are the salient features of this new course. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Charles. Uh, also, thank you for, thank you to Mon for um, already providing a lot of uh, information about the value of uh, labor migration and labor migra migration reporting uh, for journalism uh, schools but more so for Anne because uh, she already uh, provided a lot of information about CHED, about the CMOs, the CHED Memorandum Orders, um, updates regarding uh, what uh, AIJC and ILO have done in relation to this uh, project, the training activities that you have conducted uh, uh, with Charles uh, for uh, the prospective teachers of this course, and also uh, regarding the uh, HEIs, the higher educational institutions, uh, who will be adopting uh, this course uh, uh, starting this SEM. I will skip uh, most of what uh, Anne has already mentioned so that uh, our discussions can fit within the time allotted to me. So um, uh, just a brief uh, mention about uh, the CMO. Um, curricular programs in the Philippines are um, guided by CMOs or the CHED. CHED is uh, Commission on Higher Education Memorandum Orders. And the specific CMO governing the journalism programs uh, offered in the Philippines is uh, CMO number 41, uh, series of 2017, meaning uh, this was approved for implementation four years ago. Uh, there are two programs uh, covered by CMO 41. And as mentioned by Anne earlier, these are Bachelor in Journalism and Bachelor of Arts in uh, Journalism. So it's B in Journalism and BA in Journalism. Bachelor in Journalism three-year course composed of 113 units. And this 113 units um, is made up of uh, 18 units of um, core courses, 36 units of general education courses, 30 units of required courses, nine units of electives. Uh, electives here is uh, highlighted six units of cognate courses, eight units of physical education courses, and six units of NSTP courses. All of this can be finished uh, in a light schedule, uh, six terms or six semesters, three years. The Bachelor of Arts in Journalism is a four-year degree program composed of 140 units. And this 140 units uh, is made up of uh, 21 units of core courses, 36 units of general education courses, 39 units of required courses, 12 units of electives, 18 uh, units of cognate courses, eight units of physical education courses, and six units of NSTP courses. 
No, um, it, uh, as explained by Anne earlier, direction reporting course uh, can easily get into the electives uh, requirement, the electives um, slot in the program, such that in the bachelor's program, we have nine units, and uh, in the Bachelor of Arts program, we have uh, 12 units. But these nine and 12 units will have uh, to be the subject of competition among many other lined up electives per semester. So that um, a little bit explanation of explanation for this. Required courses are uh, journalism courses that are uh, mandated, that are required for students. Electives are also journalism courses that students may select from listed non-required courses. And in some universities, the listed electives are just a few, um, maybe 15, 16, uh, 15, 18, 21. In some, uh, they have as many as uh, 36 uh, units of um, electives uh, which students will have to choose from. So there's some kind of a competition here. Cognate courses are similar to electives, but these are courses that students can take from other degree programs. So if you're in journalism, you can uh, get 18 units from philosophy, psychology, mm -hmm. political science, community development, etc. Et so this is now the profile of courses in the two programs. Now, in um, trying to adopt uh, new courses, to put in uh, new um, courses into the curriculum, there are um, guide concepts that we have to keep in mind. First of all, it's the CMO. Uh, the Chad Memorandum Order, and DCMO uh, identifies minimum requirements and standards, which means the number of units uh, listed previously are merely minimum units, which means uh, they can add to this, particularly in the electives. There are some HEIs with electives uh, that are as many as uh, 18 or even 24 units. And this depends on uh, the HEI's belief that these uh, courses can uh, better prepare their students after graduation. So, the CMO. Another matter that HEI's have to consider uh, when uh, deciding uh, on including new courses into the program um, are the HEI philosophy, uh, its vision, its mission, and goals. So all of this will have uh, uh, to be considered. And this philosophy, vision, mission, and goal are multi-tiered. There's the university philosophy, mission, uh, vision, and goal. There's the college level man. There's also the uh, program level one. So all of this will have to be considered in, in uh, putting in a particular new course in the curriculum. Uh, the third uh, uh, is uh, the situation in the locality or in the region that HEIs um, have to consider when offering courses and when modifying courses so that um, um, the course offerings can answer uh, local needs and situations. And then, of course, the issue of uh, uh, the matter of academic freedom. So um, uh, adopting uh, degree programs and um, courses will have to be guided by this one. Now, let's get into the implementation options uh, for a course like um, uh, labor migration reporting. Uh, the first option is, of course, uh, full adoption of uh, uh, this proposed course uh, as an elective. Although, if uh, the 
time is uh, ripe for the re-evaluation of the curriculum in total, the members of the technical committee may consider including such a course, labor migration reporting, as part of uh, the uh, required offering. But as of now, the best that we can hope for is for this course to be included as an elective um, in uh, its uh, full form. Just like what uh, Anne has said, that uh, several HEIs uh, have started preparing for and will be offering this coming uh, first semester. Another option is uh, the adoption of uh, similar or modified courses, also as elective. Uh, the reason why some HEIs are into something similar and not the full ILO, the AIJC proposed course is that they have uh, another philosophy regarding their course offerings, their needs in their region or locality, such that some schools are considering to offer, instead of labor migration, uh, labor um, journalism, the um, labor migration journalism, uh, instead of labor migration reporting, they're offering migration journalism because they believe that um, their locality and their students would better benefit from the broader migration concept, not just focusing on labor. Um, some also, uh, just a matter of nomenclature, are uh, planning to use the term migration reporting without labor. And just like what Anne has uh, mentioned, the uh, University of Santo Tomas in its reviving its offering of a similar course more than a decade ago is using uh, the title Reporting on Global Migration, which again is not labor migration focused. So this is another option. And uh, this is part of uh, the academic freedom that HEIs have and are enjoying. Now, uh, for others who seem to find that their uh, unit offerings are quite loaded already, especially lately with uh, the pandemic, that uh, there is an advice to somewhat soften uh, the offering of courses. In fact, for some degree programs, they are advised to reduce their um, unit totals. So um, their direction is to integrate labor migration reporting in existing courses. And among the courses where this is being considered for inclusion are specialized reporting, which in fact is already among the listed uh, courses in the uh, CMO, in CMO 41 series of uh, 2017. Uh, so another, a course where integrate uh, where labor migration reporting may be integrated are such subjects are news reporting the basic one or reporting the news feature writing or even multimedia reporting uh, wherein specific assignments may be on labor migration another way of supporting um, this initiative, which is uh, labor migration reporting, is for some universities uh, uh, planning to conduct supplementary uh, programs and projects like webinars on labor migration reporting uh, that they intend to uh, enrich their current offerings. And for some, uh, I have just uh, gotten uh, the information that uh, they are planning to conduct uh, competitions on labor migration reporting outside of their curricular offerings. So there are many implementation options, not specific to the full adoption of the labor migration reporting, but in support of this initiative. Now, um, initial strides, uh, in fact, uh, has uh, have been uh, provided by Anne. Thank you, Anne. 
Uh, the pilot testing um, has been made at the University of uh, San Jose Recoletos, and this will be uh, expounded further by USJR uh, uh, Professor Juliet uh, C. Einar after my short presentation. And uh, of course, the adoption of the proposed course. Um, Anne said that uh, seven HEIs um, have committed uh, to adopt. Uh, she also mentioned the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. And as an update, uh, uh, the PUP College of Communication and Department of Journalism has filed a request to the PUP Office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs for permission to include labor migration reporting as an elective in HCBA in journalism. And uh, if I understand right, uh, in relation to this, PUP is also working out a memorandum of agreement with AIJC regarding the offering of this course and for some other support activities. Um, Anne also mentioned about uh, uh, the experience of University of Santo Tomas that um, from uh, year 2006 to year 2010, it offered a course um, titled Migration Journalism. In fact, if I uh, remember uh, right, uh, one of our members at the Technical Committee for Journalism uh, was among those who initially taught this, Professor Jeremiah Sopiniano. And uh, with the help of Professor Opiniano, who has just gotten back uh, after his uh, doctorate uh, work in Australia, and um, with the help of the current chair of the department, Professor Felipe Salvosa, they decided to uh, revive uh, a migration uh, course uh, titled it Reporting on Global Migration. And this was um, uh, offered last term. Uh, just a, an input to understand um, migration journalism and how it was offered then. By the way, when it was offered, MJ, uh, migration journalism, it had a quite good number of students uh, per class, 35 to 45 students. Uh, the new course now reporting on global migration has much less. Why was migration journalism uh, quite uh, popular at the time because it was offered as a forced elective. What is a forced elective? It's some kind of an oxymoron. Um, students are given a limited number of options. And because they, have, uh, they are given a limited number of options, uh, um, they are literally forced to enroll in it. So there's some kind of a gentle coercion the part of uh, the department that you have to enroll this. So um, this can be inputs in addition to what uh, Anne has uh, uh, made uh, earlier. Now, uh, challenges. The challenges that um, we have uh, to understand and be ready to face are first, marketing the course. And there are two levels of uh, this marketing challenge. First is how to market the course to HEIs. And uh, I understand. And I think I'm glad. And I'm glad that AIJC is doing well here uh, by convincing seven HEIs to offer this course this time. Another is, of course, to market this to students, especially in universities wherein there are a number of offered electives uh, so that they will select this from among the competitors. Another challenge is the hiring of qualified or capable teachers. And um, um, I am happy that AIJC and of course, uh, Charles uh, uh, have conducted uh, uh, training, almost one-on-one -on -one kind of uh, mentoring earlier regarding this. But uh, this has to be expanded to convince more teachers because the problem in the Philippines is that many instructors uh, come in and go quite often. So those who may have undergone training under AIJC and Charles uh, may be able to teach only for one or two terms. And after that, uh, they are promoted or they leave for another, another profession. So that's uh, hiring and equipping our training teachers. And of course, and um, 
um, the group of SARS and uh, AIJC and uh, Hussein. Um, I like the figures uh, provided by Hussein in his presentation is uh, the issue of accessing and making available teaching learning materials. This is a big problem, especially in provincial schools. They lack teaching learning materials. And then making the teaching learning experiences be satisfying to both instructors and students. So training, training, training. Now, um, I hope uh, this course will proceed, will succeed, because this uh, will have a very great impact, not only in the journalism curriculum, but also in the economic future of the Philippines and the whole region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Domingo, for sharing uh, this, uh, this presentation and explaining how this course aligns with the broader um, uh, curriculum. Um, now, we're going to have our last presentation, and I see already in the chat box that we've received some questions from the audience. Uh, thank you to those who are uh, uh, asking some of these very relevant questions. We'll open the floor uh, just after we hear from uh, Mrs. Uh, Julit uh, Jainar, who um, is, as we've said earlier, going to be uh, piloting uh, the teaching of this course amongst the different professors who will be piloting the teaching of this course. Now, uh, Juliet, you graduated with a, a, a bachelor's degree um, in mass communication and a master's degree in media studies at the University of San Jose Recoletos. You were also a scholar at Arizona State University for the American English e-teacher training program, which is under the US State Department. Prior to joining the academy, um, you were a news desk assistant at TV5 Cebu and a segment producer in Radio Cinco, as well as a news correspondent at Cebu Daily News. Uh, currently, you are working as a full-time instructor under the Department of Journalism and Communication in the School of Arts and Sciences of the University of San Jose Recoletos. Um, you've prepared a presentation, but I'd like you, if you can, to address the following questions. Uh, first of all, maybe tell us why you were interested in teaching this course to start with. Um, afterwards, maybe um, walk us through a little bit what the, what the process was to actually teach this course. Um, and finally, you're going to be teaching this course um, uh, this current semester, um, what outcomes do you expect from, from your students? The floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction, Charles. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, to our participants. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Now, um, labor migration in the Philippines is uh, very important uh, because it is the national thrust for economic growth. Uh, globally, more people than ever. There are a lot of people, uh, Filipinos. There are a lot of uh, people who want to have a better life abroad. Uh, as estimated, there are around 10 million Filipinos live abroad. Um, and more than 1 million Filipino leave the country each year. So why do we see the need to introduce uh, this subject or this course to our future journalists? So last week, we officially started our, um, our class. And um, of course, I presented to my students the, I presented the, the, the scope of uh, the course. But to answer the question, uh, why is it important to integrate this subject uh, to our curriculum, especially for um, this journalism students? The importance basically of um, labor migration and the stories of our migrant workers are the reasons why we decide to um, integrate this subject. And of course, with I think our chairman is here, with uh, approval of our uh, dean and our chairman, uh, Dr. Mila Caballero, under the elective course uh, Beat Reporting, we decided to uh, focus cost on uh, labor by labor migration reporting and of course another reason why we uh, uh, see the relevance of this uh, course um, is that there is um, an interest of uh, the students however um, there was a lack of um, resources 
Last week, as mentioned earlier, um, earlier we uh, officially started our uh, class. We already had our synchronous class. And when I presented the scope to the students, uh, honestly, I received a positive response from them. Uh, there was even one student who shared about the life of her uh, mother in Hong Kong. And there was even uh, one student also who shared about the life of her um, relative. So basically, that itself would make the students be more interested about this um, course. And also, um, it is uh, important to let our students uh, realize the, the roles and the responsibilities of the media uh, in, re uh, in reporting on labor migration, um, especially uh, now that we are facing this uh, pandemic and the COVID-19 crisis um, has migrant workers uh, they play a very essential a role in the society, especially now that we are facing this pandemic. However, it has also ex um, um, exposed their vulnerability uh, to the devastating health, um, economic, and social impact of the pandemic. So um, I, I'd like to show uh, a short clip. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to show uh, a short clip of our um, synchronous class. Uh, I already informed my student about this. And uh, I asked my students about what is the importance of, uh, why is it that the journalist should be concerned about the stories of our migrant workers? And of course, I also asked as to what is the relevance of this course to their degree program. And by the way, the one that you can see right now, uh, I showed that also as an introduction to uh, my student. I showed that to my students. I explained that to them. And um, next slide, please. Uh, okay, here's a short video clip. I hope it will play. Uh, uh, can you hear uh, the video? There is an audio. I don't think the sound is working on the video, but Yulit, maybe you can you yeah. can tell us about it. Okay, uh, I'm just going to share about it. But uh, I was really delighted to with the, the answer of my And student. who are our people, quote unquote? Um, sila ang people of the Philippines mostly, and because these OFWs come from the Philippines, we also our responsibility is extended to them to make sure that their stories are heard, to make sure that their stories will be told, and then to make sure that something happens from there. Uh, even though we are not journalists are not the ones who technically exact the change uh, that is needed for this system. For example, we still can be the catalysts for that change to happen. We can uh, show and expose the dire circumstances of the OFWs. For example, we can tell them how um, OFWs are in need of more uh, support, of more welfare, especially when they're already hired in uh, the other countries. And then if there is danger in that country, how do we uh, manage them better. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are actually two clips. Responsibilities to the people and who are our uh, I think people, it, quote and um, Excuse me. Okay, okay. We have to and to miss naka realize uh, along the discussion mm -hmm. so far how labor migration is also we have to and to miss naka realize uh, along the discussion so far how labor migration is also one of the big things that we have to consider uh, consider as a beat gani uh, maybe there's uh, very less uh, there's less to anlang reporting on that like ang ma focus lang nato is when uh, pe when people when OFWs unfortunately uh, are victims of harassment, victims of, of de deportation threats, victims of rape and murder outside the country. But uh, re uh, reports on how we can better help them, reports on 
um, the stories that need to be told dude, dili lang katong medyo sensational na stories kay uh, I think it's a little less and there are no more nuanced uh, reports on that wala pa yung follow pa ayo so far sa akong nakita miss wala pa dude kayo ka so okay uh, that was Iver Villegas my second year college student and I was really delighted with his answer and I was really happy that as early as second year uh, he can already identify the, the relevance of this course and I am of course happy that and thankful to um, AIJC and um, the International Labor Organization for making USJR uh, part of this pilot teaching so before we went um, on board uh, the international um, ILO and um, AIJC um, actually made sure that uh, we will be equipped with sufficient knowledge on how to teach labor migration. Uh, we were even part of the uh, part of the making of the, the syllabus and of course they also organized um, a two-day uh, webinar uh, for journalism um, educators and um, uh, next slide please uh, i'd like to show the like screenshot of our uh, webinar so there uh, they conducted um, a one-on-one -on -one training they also had a one-on-one -on -one training with um, mr charles and during the the one-on-one -on -one coaching um, i was able to clarify uh, some topics of the course and mr charles was um, able to give us um suggestion okay of what activities that you can actually do for this class and uh, like what i said earlier we also took part um, in validating the the course structure uh, um structure during uh, the coaching sessions and uh, one of the online uh, resources that they also presented during um the the, the coaching sessions because during the course of the coaching sessions uh, I'm so thankful because they were able to provide us with um, a lot of um, resources, online resources, and one of which is, um, that was mentioned earlier, uh, the Media Toolkit. Um, next slide, please, so I can show to the um, audience how it looks like. So there, that is um, the, the toolkit uh, for uh, the journalists reporting on forced labor and fair uh, recruitment. That was, was prepared by ILO. And um, it was during the, the webinar, to be honest, that I realized the, the relevance of um, integrating this course. Uh, I remember uh, one of the speakers, I think it was Miss Patty, who actually um, emphasized uh, the need for education components um, in the reports. Uh, it was also uh, mentioned that early coverages, the uh, early coverages on labor migration actually lack in the reporting of OFW issues. And um, emphasis on good news uh, might actually cause people to see the OFWs as uh, quote unquote uh, cash machines. So um, also some stories uh, lack explanation of the contradictory policies or views of the government and advocates. And um, it was also during the webinar that it was um, during the webinar that they also emphasized the need for the future journalists to basically learn the about the solutions based reporting because uh, people nowadays no we, we don't just want to know about the problems but at the same time we also want to know about the the solutions that's why when Iver mentioned um that's why my when earlier my student mentioned um his answer that sometimes we uh journalists of course should also learn how to look at different angles so uh, that's why this sub course is uh, really relevant and that's why we've decided to integrate this course and um another another um thing that i can actually remember during our training is that uh, the, the future journalists should also learn about the rights-based approach to labor migration uh, that is why topics uh, about international and national legal framework which was mentioned by um, charles earlier and most common violations are part of the syllabus so another speaker um, emphasized also the importance of uh, contextualized um, reporting because um, as stated you know, as stated in the philippine migration journalism handbook 
when the stories of um, late, when the stories about migration are put into uh, in proper context, readers and of course viewers are better able to understand um, the migration phenomenon and are better able to reflect on whether migration is um, really a good thing or a bad thing for the country. So I hope that by the end of uh, the semester, I hope that by the end of the semester, students now will be able to become more interested and of course uh, relate um, the, the stories, relate the stories of their personal experience or uh, the experience of their community. And um, actually, I also, can you, uh, next slide please. I also presented this one to my students when uh, during our uh, second uh, synchronous class, uh, the importance of investigative journalism or uh, the labor migration reporting as well, that uh, we can be the voice, right? That the future journalists can be the voice, um, especially for those people who are normally unheard, for example. And of course, um, oh, this will also uncover uh, stories and uh, make people those in power be accountable if they're, they're should, they should be accountable. And of course, sometimes it would be quoted. Their stories will be quoted. And there is also a possibility that their story will also be, will have a positive change. So that, that is why, um, to the question, what would I expect after the, the, uh, the course, after the, the semester, I expect that uh, they will actually remember the responsibilities and uh, responsibilities of uh, the journalist, such as uh, giving adequate uh, media coverage, um, exposing uh, the truth about the migrant migrants without actually causing um, harm to them. And by avoiding sensationalism, uh, stereotyping and generalization or underreporting. So I am so happy that um, our chairman, our um, dean, uh, allowed me to focus, allowed us, uh, allowed yes, um, that focus this um, uh, the special beat reporting will be focused more on um, labor migration reporting. So there, back, I'm back to you, Charles. Thank you very much, uh, Judith, for this uh, um, presentation and. I find that very interesting that um, uh, you um, shared with us that, you know, some of your students, um, and it's not really surprising, are directly connected with their uh, parents, um, close relatives to this story of labor migration. And I find that very interesting that they can find in the classroom um, um, the possibility to explore uh, issues uh, with which they are already somewhat familiar with, uh, but they don't necessarily, um, they're not necessarily used to seeing in the classroom. And um, if that resonates with their personal experience, I think we're on track uh, with, with something that's relevant. I'd like to open now to some of the questions we've received or comments we've received from the audience. We've received an interesting comment I'd like to um, uh, share with you from Eunice who is a migrant worker and also a journalist based in Thailand. And um, she tells us that she finds this discussion very interesting. Thank you for that. But also that um, they are often called uh, modern heroes, quote unquote, um, even though uh, she sometimes feels that uh, they are actually more uh, labor uh, expert than, than modern heroes. And I think uh, Eunice, um, uh, your, your comment is quite illustrative of one of the challenges that we're trying to address with this course, which is to um, bring um, more nuance and complexity in the way we see uh, labor migration. Um, if you look at labor migration reporting in the Philippines or elsewhere, um, in the majority of cases is a very, very polarized reporting. Um, there's a lot of sensational stories. Labor migration makes the news when something dramatic happens. And we see in many countries that the only representation that we have in the media of labor migration is when labor migration goes wrong. Um, and on the other hand, especially in the COVID-19 context, we've seen a lot of stories about how um, uh, labor migrants have had um, a heroic contribution, and in many cases that was true. Um, 
But the reality is, is somewhat more complex. The reality of labor migration experiences for the over 1 million, sometimes 1.9 million people who uh, go on the labor migration journey in the case of Philippines, it's often more complex. And it's precisely that complexity uh, that we would like to explore. And also what Anne mentioned, and which is relevant in the case of, of Professor uh, Julie Jainar, is that this course is going to be taught in different regions uh, of the Philippines. And we've really invited teachers to adapt the standard syllabus to the specificity uh, of uh, the region where they are teaching this course. Uh, we have some regions in the Philippines which are very connected to seafaring activities and labor migration for seafarers might be different um, uh, an experience as uh, people who embark on a journey in the construction sector or in domestic work or as nurses. And so teachers will have the freedom, the academic freedom to adapt this standard course to the specificities of their um, audience uh, and of the region where they are teaching this course. Juliet, I'd like to ask you one of the questions we've received, um, uh, which is basically this, um, uh, this elective course uh, uh, will make me a better uh, uh, labor beat reporter. How will this elective course make me a better labor, labor beat reporter? And if I, if I follow this course as a student, will I only specialize in reporting on labor issues or will I also gain perspective on other beats? Okay. Uh, well, I am, like what I've mentioned earlier, we are so blessed that uh, ILO and IJ AIJC uh, provided us with um, enough preferences or long references on how to teach this course. Um, if you try to check uh, the, the syllabus, uh, the, the suggested syllabus of um, reporting on labor migration, you will actually see there different topics that will tackle about, um, for example, rights, like what I've uh, mentioned earlier, rights-based approach to labor migration, um, the economics of labor migration, and as well as uh, the different responsibilities and how are we going to tell the stories to the public? Because as, er as mentioned also earlier that uh, there were stories that lack in-depth reporting. So if we, um, if we peruse, if we check again our uh, syllabus, there are um, a lot of other topics, um, as is what I mentioned a while ago, um, how to get the stories, how um, instead of just focusing more on like the other aspect of um, labor migration, just like what one of the participants mentioned earlier, they are considered as a modern hero, but in reality, uh, they are also referring to the other, um, what, what may say in the labor, um, uh, the, the, the modern hero. So, so basically at, at least uh, students would be able or the future, especially the future journalist and as well as the journalist, because uh, the, the, the ILO also provided a media kit or media tools um, that will also serve as a guide for the journalists, or, or especially the future journalists. And of course, um, about the second question, uh, well, the, the course really um, is focused more on uh, labor migration reporting. However, if we this is also based on experience. When I was in college, uh, of course, we don't have this uh, course and we don't have this uh, subject. And when I became a journalist, when I uh, um, started working in the media industry, uh, I also noticed that there were, especially here in Cebu City, especially here in Cebu City, we don't have much uh, stories about um, OFWs. And that is something that we need to address. Now, uh, yes, we only have few beats in Cebu City. And I'm referring to Cebu City, we have few beats. Uh, um, there is no specific beat. But um, in this course, in this course, uh, there is a possibility that we can also learn about, um, for example, um, when we say police beat, Okay, because sometimes we only know the what, when, why, the, 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 the blotter story, but sometimes we have to go beyond uh, the blotter reporting. So it's, it's just the same here in uh, labor migration reporting that we have to go beyond the blotter. We have to understand more about the story, what went wrong, what are the, the laws that will protect our uh, migrant uh, workers. So I think I, I hope I answered the question. 
Thank you, Jolit. I'll, I'll move on to a second question and maybe <clears throat> Hussein, you can uh, give us some uh, um, uh, guidance on this. Uh, Jomar Soriano uh, is asking us why um, it was decided uh, um, that it, it would be specifically labor migration reporting that would be included in the journalism curriculum rather than maybe something a bit broader like migration in general. Um, uh, what, what do you um, have to say about this? Uh, thanks, uh, Jomar, for the question. That's actually a very interesting question. No? Um, labor migration, in particular, is a multidisciplinary subject. So the fact that we piloted it in a journalism course as an elective course is really specific to the mandate of the ILO. And I'll get to that later on. Um, in fact, more labor migration is actually being taught in gender studies in some uh, colleges in the Philippines, like Miriam uses uh, migration in their gender studies. Uh, the University of the Philippines also uses migration perspectives in political science or population studies, area studies. In fact, the ILO has already started uh, speaking with AIJC on piloting it in development communication, DevCom, no? as, as again, another um, elective course. So it's not really limited to journalism, no? but we really wanted to bring in journalists because this is the mandate of the ILO. We thought that if we tap journalists, we would be able to uh, ask, ask very significant questions such as why do uh, news reporters still use domestic helpers instead of domestic workers? They are not going abroad to work as a helper, they're not just gonna help. They actually are going there as workers. They have workers' rights. The Philippine state has ratified the um, ILO Convention 189 on domestic work. And the, the state is actually accountable to make sure that there are mechanisms to protect OFWs who go abroad as domestic workers. One quick, with one other quick point is that the Philippines also ratified uh, Conventions 87 on freedom of association meaning my right to join a union, and also Convention 98, my right to basically uh, join a union in order for me to have the right to collective bargaining. So these are uh, conventions that were ratified by the Philippine state, and yet we still continue to send OFWs to destination countries that do not respect the rights of OFWs to join unions. So these are questions that journalists can actually raise in their in their reporting. So we thought that it would, would be very strategic for the ILO to engage with journal, Filipino journalists to ask these very significant questions. Thank you, Hussein. And if I, if I can follow up on your answer, it's true that uh, just to share a little bit an insight from the experience, we had some challenges to actually fit this elective course in, in the format of, of, of the time that was allotted to the course. Uh, to say that when you want to go in depth to help students understand what labor migration is about and how they can report on it, it's already quite challenging. Now, Jomar, I think you're absolutely right. Um, other aspects of migration are very relevant in the, in the context of the Philippines. I would think, for example, of climate change induced migration, which would be really relevant to speak with students. But it's true that the option that we took um, was to narrow down um, the course to something quite tangible, which is already very vast. We're going to be expecting from students to learn about a, a lot of things, um, but it's maybe what felt was most uh, um, interesting in the context of the Philippines, considering the importance of labor migration in the country. Um, moving on, I'd like to um, uh, ask a question to, to, to Ramon. Um, 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 this uh, webinar we're doing is in the framework of the uh, World Journalism Education Council, and it's part of the uh, <laughs> fifth year of this council uh, activity. Uh, which aims, I believe, to uh, create bridges between different journalism education contexts. Um, uh, you've uh, observed the whole dynamic of creating this labor migration reporting course in the Philippines. Uh, but as you stated in the beginning of your introduction, it, this issue isn't relevant just to the Philippines. Do you think that um, 
this Philippines experience may be transposable elsewhere in other countries. And some of the educators that are listening to us could actually pick up on this experience. Thank you, Charles. I think in your introduction, I didn't ask you to introduce me as an OFW. <laughs> I'm an overseas Filipino worker. I work also with UNESCO. I'm assigned in, in Myanmar as a media development specialist. And uh, I talked to my head of agency and we agreed that in the near future, we are going to develop a handbook and also conduct a training on labor migration reporting in Myanmar, hopefully to be handled by the Myanmar Journalism Institute. It's the largest training institution in the country. And that's one, that's for the, for practicing journalists. And uh, attending this webinar also is the head of the Department of Journalism of the National Management Degree College in, in Myanmar. It's the only formal journalism school in Myanmar. And they have also expressed interest in probably integrating also labor migration reporting in the curriculum as an elective. Because Myanmar, like the Philippines, quote unquote, exports thousands of citizens uh, for the labor market, primarily in China, in Thailand, if I'm not mistaken, and other South Asian countries as well. But there's also a very interesting issue that the UN in general is looking into, and this dealt mostly on the issue of global migration. And this is something to do about training young people, the youth in particular, on how to handle hate speech and discrimination, particularly among migrant workers or among, among migrants, not necessarily migrant workers. So hate speech, discrimination among migrants. This is where the book recently book uh, recently launched book reporting on migrants and refugees will come very helpful and very useful. My colleague Monica, I think, is with us also today, who is one of the authors of this recently published UNESCO book. So very in in bottom line is a lot of opportunities within the region of Asia Pacific, and uh, for Amy, we will definitely adapt labor migration reporting as one of our flagship areas in the very near future. Thank you very Thank you, much, uh, Ramon. And uh, it's true what you're stating. I think uh, this is a, a growing field. Um, I think it's quite timely that we acknowledge the fact that migration in general and, and labor migration in particular is a very important aspect of modern societies. I think the COVID-19 pandemic revealed to us uh, how much we rely on, on labor migration. Uh, you can look in some uh, uh, Western countries how harvesting uh, was actually completely um, uh, disorganized by the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that seasonal migrant workers could not come into um, uh, the countries where they are used to, uh, to do the harvests. So, we're really coming to understand how much we rely on labor migration. And uh, we can only better understand that if we have journalists which are correctly equipped um, uh, to tell that story and to understand that story. I see we're uh, running a bit late on time. Um, I just want to pick up on some questions and maybe address them uh, um, uh, quickly. Um, we uh, received a question from Monica Lengauer from uh, uh, TU Dortmund University. Um, Ramon already mentioned the great work that has been done by Dortmund University with UNESCO uh, in crafting uh, a handbook also uh, on migration reporting in general for the classrooms. We highly recommend that. Um, uh, Monica wanted to know if uh, within this initiative of labor migration reporting elective course, there will be the possibility uh, to um, uh, support some collaborative reporting uh, that's actually something we're looking at 
Um, and with the teachers who are piloting the course in the Philippines, part of what we did with AIJC, with um, uh, uh, Ms. Anne and, and the different teachers was to identify um, resources, uh, contacts in destination countries so that we could um, help students as they are following this course, connect with the realities in destination countries. Um, the International Labour Organization is working on these specific issues in other countries. And what we'd really like to see, especially because this has become really easy, I would say, in, in the Zoom era, would be for students of the class of uh, Ms. Juliet Jainar to have the possibility maybe in the future to explore labor migration issues and labor migration reporting with journalism students in destination countries, um, students in Malaysia, students in Qatar, um, in Lebanon. And that would be uh, very interesting, of course, to expand the knowledge of students, but also uh, to help them network and connect with future journalists um, that will be working in those countries and that could prove to be very um, uh, helpful when they, when they start their activities. Um, we also received a question to know if there will be an evaluation of the course. And I would say more broadly for anyone who's interested in this course, the rollout, how the piloting of this course goes with students, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. I assume that with the AIJC website or with the AMIC website, you can get in touch with us. And it would be great um, for us to be able to share the results of these uh, activities with anyone who's interested. Um, I know we're already a bit late. I would just like to give the opportunity for all the speakers to have one last comment. And then maybe I will ask Ramon uh, to mention again, what are the next uh, events that our audience should put on their calendar um, with regards to AMIC uh, activities. So, um, uh, Hussein, if you have any last comments, please. Thanks, Charles. I just want to uh, thank the organizers of this webinar, of course, uh, AMIC, AIJC, UNESCO, and of course, Charles, you've done a lot of great work for, for you know, this initiative for this uh, uh, labor migration um, curriculum. So thank you, uh, Charles. Thanks, Hussein. And uh, you, uh, it's almost, it's not quite the end of the journey, but you've put a lot of effort. What's your, what's your final comment for today? <laughs> you're, on, you're on mute, sorry. Well, Charles, particularly for the Philippines, uh, teaching the teaching the course on reporting on labor migration is really long overdue. And I hope that many more journalism schools will teach this course in the coming semesters. And I really would like to thank AMIC and the World Journalism Education Council for helping promote this course. And thank you so much for this full support of ILO, specifically Hussein and Charles, without whom we, will, we would not have been able to do this. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Domingo, um, uh, what would be your last words? Congratulations to the organizers, uh, to Charles, to Hussein, uh, to Anne, to Mon, uh, for this very laudable activity. Indeed, there are a lot of uh, stories waiting to be told about um, OFWs, about labor migration. There are a lot of perspectives that need to be explained and to be delivered to uh, people for them to appreciate and understand. And I just hope, as uh, Anna said, there will be more uh, HEIs, uh, universities and colleges uh, that will offer labor migration reporting. And there will be more students who will hope to get this as an elective um, across the different possible electives that they may choose from. Indeed, we are in the right direction. I hope all of these efforts will succeed. Congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, Professor Jainar, as you start teaching this course, what, what would you like to share with us? Some last words. 
Uh, of course, I would like to thank um, the organizers and thank you so much, AIJC. On behalf of the, the University of San Jose Recoletos, thank you so much for making us part of this um, uh, initiative or thank you for be, uh, making us part of this uh, um, advocacy. And um, of course, uh, rest assured that as an educator, as a journalism educator, I'll make sure that I will be able to deliver to the students the things that they actually need to uh, learn about labor migration. Reporting. So once again, to the organizers, thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, the, the syllabus is available on the AIJC website, as well as a list of resources. Don't hesitate to download it, to share it with anyone who could be interested and to get in touch with us. And I leave it uh, to Ramon Toison, uh, who started this webinar and who has now the big responsibility for some concluding words. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you, thank you, Charles, and to the team. Maraming, maraming salamat po. Uh, after this forum, I my plate is full, actually, <laughs> both within the country and outside the Philippines. For, for the Philippines, Hossein mentioned about the possibility of integrating migration communication in the development communication curriculum in the Philippines. I think it is something that is worth pursuing, which would complement the labor migration reporting in the journalism curriculum. For AMIC next year, I hope that the same team can help me organize an exchange among journalism educators and students who are taking up or are interested in the course on labor migration. You know, some I was looking at the list of participants who registered and I hope they were present. And I noticed a sizable number of journalism educators from South Asia, where there are many migrant workers, Bangladesh, India, and even some countries, which I'm very happy that they have joined us, Bhutan, Maldives, they do not usually join, but they have registered and I hope they are also present here. So let's look at possibility of holding a sharing, a technical sharing on labor migration reporting in Asia. And, uh, you know, one topic that we missed, although we have mentioned this in the past, is look at the frontliners today in other countries, in Western countries. Most of them are migrant workers. Many of them are migrant Filipino workers. We always say there are heroes, right? There are modern heroes. But there are many stories about how these medical frontliners, mostly migrant workers, are taking the lead in addressing the issue of COVID-19, in addressing the pandemic. That's a very important lesson that we have learned of how important labor migration is. Having mentioned the pandemic, let me again encourage all of you to please join us in our 28th annual conference, the AMIC annual conference on November 20, 27, and December 4. You can visit our microsite, our website. I think my colleagues have put it there, Science Communication, Managing the Now and the Future. Uh, without, I'm sure without uh, contradiction, my colleagues would say that among the best minds in Asia, are among our plenary speakers, not only Asia, because Noam Chomsky is not Asian, but Mohan Dutta, John Servais, and many others have joined us, are joining us in this conference. And if you have not submitted your abstracts, our abstracts are still open until end of September. And uh, there will be a special session a post-conference on the results of the survey of the World Journalism Education Council. They conducted a survey 
on uh, the future of journalism education. The results of the survey, particularly on the Asia-Pacific leg, will be presented uh, as one of the post-conference uh, events. And we will again invite all of you to, to join us in this conference. And hopefully that is also another platform where we can advocate for the inclusion of labor migration reporting. We have started it. We should continue. There's no stopping us in promoting labor migration reporting. Maraming maraming salamat po. Magandang araw sa ating lahat. Good day to all of us. Over to you, Charles. Thank you to all of us who've joined and uh, we hope we can continue the discussion uh, shortly. Have a nice day uh, and you can find the recording um, available uh, just after uh, this webinar. Thank you very much to all our speakers and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.